Income Tax 2023-2024, Small Business, How to Pay Income Tax, Tax Software Example. Get ready and some coffee so we can recognize the code cracks when doing income tax. Preparation 2023-2024. Here we are and first a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us but but that's okay whatever because our merchandise is is better than their stupid stuff anyways like our crunchy numbers is my cardio product line now i'm not saying that subscribing to this channel crunching numbers with us will make you thin fit and healthy or anything however it does seem like it worked for her just saying so you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise so you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Our Form 1040 example problem using Lacert Tax Software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but if you have access to software, it's a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to forms, schedules, instructions at the IRS website irs.gov irs.gov standard starting point here adam tax man just trying to avoid a dang tax man living in beverly hills 90210 got no dependents to start off with we have the w-2 income at the 100,000. line 12 standard deduction for the single filer 13,850. that gives us the taxable income 86,150, which we can mirror in our income tax formula in Excel. 100,000 income standard deduction, 13,850. The taxable income, 86,150. We're letting the software calculate the tax, which is coming to 14,266 to start off, which on page number two, there's the 14,266. Let's go back to page number one. Now, when we do the data input into the software, Oftentimes, it gets quite complicated to do the data input just to get down here to this 86,150. This is what I would call, in essence, the income statement portion of the income tax return. The income statement part of the income tax formula, the bottom line being taxable income, which is similar to net income, income minus expenses, income minus deductions getting us to the 86 150. now most of this information we can double check because we have source documents for them oftentimes such as the w-2s such as the 1099s and so on and so forth so oftentimes it is useful for us to mirror that data input in something like excel given the fact that we don't have a double entry accounting system in the tax return to make sure that we didn't do a data input error. Therefore, intern it two times is a useful tool. That could get us down to this number, halfway down basically our income tax formula. We are then often gonna rely on the software to do the tax calculation, which we took a look at in the prior presentation, it applying then the, the progressive tax structure with the multiple tax tiers and so on and so forth, and also breaking out types of income that might have special circumstances re related to them or more favorable rates for example such as long-term capital gains that's on page two here we could see the tax calculation according to the the tiers and we also have could have favorable rates for things like qualified dividends for example all right so once we have that there then we're going to be we're going to be looking at the credits later by the way because the credits you'll note in this category we have tax and credits and then down here in the payments it says payments but you also see basically credits down here in the payment area so the credits are going to greatly complicate things we'll talk about credits more later but the reason they're both up top here in the tax and credits and down here in the payments is because you might have some credits that are refundable some that are not refundable either way 
if you had a dollar of a credit versus a dollar of a deduction, both of them are good for taxes, lowering the tax bill typically, but the dollar credit would lower the tax bill by the entire dollar, whereas the dollar deduction would only decrease the taxable income upon which this tax calculation would uh, apply. So that's why the credits have to be on the bottom part of the formula, so they're not just reducing the net income, but actually reducing the tax bill dollar for dollar. And then on top of that, you also have those credits that are gonna be useful to take the taxable, the tax bill down to zero or the, or the tax liability down to zero versus those types of credits that could take the tax liability below zero, which doesn't make sense from a tax standpoint, right? Because taxes are something you pay to the government if taxes are not being paid to the government and the government is paying you, it's not really a tax. It's more like a welfare or benefit program, a safety net program, which is fine, but the terminology gets confusing, right? So they're using the tax code in that case for refundable payments as a type of benefit or welfare prog program, not to collect taxes in that case, but rather to give benefits uh, through the tax payment. So we'll talk more about that later. For now, however, we want to think about the payments uh, that we're going to be making most commonly, most notably, most familiarly done with the withholdings on uh, the W-2s. But first, just let's think about the general concept of this. When we collect our income throughout the year, whether it be as an employee or whether it be as a sole proprietor business owner, we can't just wait till the end of the year calculate the tax using the software and then pay this like if i owe this 14266 as of april 15 2024 for tax year 2023 i can't just pay that to the government because then they'll hit me metaphorically with the sticks of penalties and interest that's what i'm trying to avoid getting hit with the sticks of penalties and interest how do i do that i pay the government during 2023 so it's not like you're doing it out of convenience. It's not like, oh, I'm paying during 2023 because that's just easier. It might, you could, you can argue that, but that's what the IRS would say. Well, it's just, we're making it easy on you. You pay it during the year, take it out of your W-2s. And then we, and then at the end of the year, we'll give you a small refund. That's not really what's happening here. They're forcing us to take it out during 2023. Otherwise, it would make more sense not to pay it during 2023 hold on to your money as long as possible because that's normal cash flow management and then pay it as late as you're able to pay it which in this case if they let us pay it at april 15th then we would just pay it at that point in time obviously we can't do that why because you get hit with the penalties and interest they hit you with the sticks so how do we avoid that we pay during the year most people if you have a w-2 uh, job the government has major employer into their uh into their their uh tool right into their collection tool into their tax agent so your employer is the one that has to take the money from you out of your wages and then basically pay it to the government in accordance with the w-4 that you are giving them that is also in accordance to basic tax tables trying to determine what would be the proper amount to deduct which is quite complex given the fact that we have a progressive tax system so it's not like we could just take the the average tax rate and use that as the deduction we that might be one of the methods we try we try to take last year's average tax rate or something and then apply that over the entire year predicting what you're going to earn in the current tax year and so on but the tables are de are designed to over uh, to over withhold a little bit. Why? Because the only way to avoid getting hit with the with the penalties and interest is to pay the right amount of tax, which means you, you, you need to pay in advance. So the idea is if we pay a little bit over, then we, we are likely not to get hit with the sticks of penalties and interest and we'll get a little bit of a refund. So that's gonna be the uh, general idea. Note that if it was a perfect world, if you've ever dealt with payroll taxes, for example, Social Security and Medicare for a business, they actually withhold the payroll taxes 
uh, and then they file a f informational form 941 on a quarterly basis instead of a yearly basis typically. And that payroll tax form, they don't owe any taxes and they don't get a refund. Why? Because the payroll taxes are not so complex and therefore they pay the proper payroll tax during the time period that payroll is being processed and then the the return is just an informational return that is the concept of the form 1040 we're supposed to pay the taxes as we earn the revenue then file the form 1040 once a year after the year is ended and it should just be an informational return saying hey look this is the income i made this is the tax i owe i already paid you because that's how we set it up but the tax code for federal income taxes is way too complex to actually get the tax perfectly paid uh, when the year is happening. So what ends up happening? Again, we shoot for an overpayment to avoid getting hit with the sticks of the penalties and interest, metaphorically speaking. Notice that you can see that on the form W-2 here. So note when, you, when we look at our good old W-2, We've got wages in box one. That represents what we earned for federal income taxes, which might be decreased by things like putting money into a 401k plan that might be represented, say, in box 12. Then we have the federal income tax that was withhold. That's the, the business being the government's tool, taking the money out of, your, uh, out of your account before you get it. And then you've got your social security wages here that are subject to uh, the social security tax. And the government, again, took that money out. Notice that the social security line four and line six are things that most tax uh, input, data input, we can basically kind of ignore. We put that into the software, but usually it's not gonna have a big impact. Why? Because we, we paid the proper amount of tax usually. Now, not always, you could have a case where you have multiple W-2s and your social security withholding was over the cap because you had multiple jobs or something like that. But usually the social security and Medicare is paid properly. So this is just an informational return given to the government and it doesn't really have a whole lot of impact on our tax uh, preparation. Whereas the federal income tax definitely does because it's impossible for us to properly calculate the amount of federal income taxes, that's why we shoot basically for uh, the small refund. So that's gonna be uh, the general idea. So down in the payments, we've got the federal income tax uh, withholding. So we have uh, the W-2s. So obviously the W-2s would be on this most common form. The W-2s are going to both us as the employee, they're also going to the government. So if you just have W-2 wages and you have a very basic tax return, the government pretty much has everything they need to basically automate the tax themselves, right? They could basically do their own taxes. That's why they can adjust things on their end. So remember, obviously, if it's on a W-2, you gotta make sure the data input is exactly right. It should be the same. If the W-2 is wrong, then we have to go back to the employer to get them to fix it because the IRS has a copy of it. So we're going to say we have the W-2 wages and then the federal income tax withheld. If I do my data input over here to uh, our data input, we're going to say wages. And so here's the federal. Now notice in my data input, if I just put wages in box one, the software will guess social security wages and Medicare wages. As we discussed before, those two wages in a prior presentation, those two wages could differ because we might have something deductible for federal income taxes, not for Social Security and Medicare. But the general idea is that once we put the Social Security and Medicare wages, because it's basically a flat tax or closer to a flatter, a flatter tax, the software can, can kind of calculate the Social Security and Medicare. Whereas the federal income tax, it can't, right? It's not even gonna try to guess that. We have to put in, we have to put in whatever we're gonna put in. Let's say it was 20,000 federal income tax. So then if I go back on over, so now we had the, uh, the total tax of the 14,266. We paid 20,000 into the system and that's gonna give us then our overpayment. If I mirror that over here in our formula, I'm gonna say this is calculated by the software and then I'm gonna put my tax payments on the bottom part of the formula and I'm gonna say this came from the W-2. What did we say? 20, 
20,000, which is going to be pulling into the formula over here. So now we've got the 20,000. We have the 5,734 of the overpayment matching uh, 5,734, uh, what we have over here. Now, obviously, if you're a W-2 employee, you have withholdings. And if this was substantially large, let's say that we think that 5,734 is possibly more of a refund than I need. What I would like to do is make this as close to as possible the actual tax that I'm going to owe because if I do that, then my W-2 or my wages will be higher. So obviously, the more, the higher the withholdings that we take out of each paycheck, the lower our actual paycheck from a week to week basis. Ideally, we would like to have our paycheck as high as possible, getting our money as soon as possible, so we can either use it or invest it sooner rather than later. So what we would like to do is get actually this refund to be as low as possible while still avoiding the sticks of penalties and interest. So how can we do that? We can use safe harbor rules basically saying, this is my last year's income. And so the, my next year's income, I'm gonna basically, IRS, look, this, the only thing I could do is base next year's income based on what I knew last year. And I could try to try to uh, say, use the same basically withholdings that I had in the prior year, because that's the only way I can predict what my income will be uh, next year. So clearly, if you think your income is going to be the same next year, you might try to adjust your withholdings so that throughout the entire year, you end up with something pretty close to zero payments or a small refund to uh, avoid the penalties. Now, obviously, with the withholdings, you're typically it's going to be some kind of of uh, percent withholding that will basically be even throughout the year. So notice because it's a progressive tax system, you have to annualize your income for the year and then figure out how much to withhold. Now you have tools on the IRS website to do this. Uh, these are, these are, there's, there's an, there's an uh, withholding estimator. So if you go to irs.gov and look up the withholding estimator, you can use that tool. And of course we can use our tax software to, to run estimates in the following year to say, okay, what would happen uh, in the following year, if my income was to go up to a certain amount, how much would I have to withhold? And then how much would I have to withhold on a check by check basis in order to get the proper withholdings to basically come out to a break even point. So that's going to be the general idea. Normally for people, it's pretty close from year to year. So you can use prior year's numbers as a gauge as to what's going to happen next year. But if substantial things change, they're going to get a substantial raise or another person in the house is working or loses their job or something like that. Or if they buy a home or if they have a child, these are big events that will change the withholdings, which you're going to have to make an adjustment for either using software like this or going to the IRS website possibly and using their withholding uh, calculator. All right. So the W-2 withholdings aren't as stable as they used to be because it used to be that people worked like my my family many families they they worked for one company their entire career and their pay raise schedule was based on something that basically was just a table you've worked here so many years and now you've got this much of a raise very standardized very easy to follow but these days obviously you don't have a one income f household anymore and even if you do the, the wages are changing all the time. Someone might be working at one place in one year. They might be working someplace else later. We now have inflation that's going to change, you know, the, the pay trajectory of people as well. So even if you just have a W-2 situation and not self-employment, it can be quite complex to keep up your withholdings. And that's going to be important as a tax preparer as well, because if you notice that people are changing their jobs and whatnot, or or then or they have over they have an overpayment here or an underpayment then we want to help them what you can do part of is is part of the planning part of things helping them to make proper withholdings using estimating tools and software or possibly the irs.gov uh, withholding estimator and that's just a common thing that that on tax preparation we can do most likely as income goes up you can you can have a more of a 
revenue for not just for tax preparation, but for tax planning purposes, of course. Okay. What if this person is now in retirement? If they were in retirement, I'm not going to change the age rate here, but I'll just change the numbers. I'm going to say instead of withholdings here, duh, duh, they're probably going to get withholdings from uh, uh, the, the 1099R from like a 401k plan or something. Or uh, so, so what happens there is we're going to have hopefully a distribution code of seven. And this would be on a, this would be on like a form 1099R, which might not look exactly like this, but it should have the same boxes, right? And so we've got the gross distributions and then we've got the taxable amount. And then you've got the distribution code, which if, if it's a normal distribution would typically be like a seven here. And then this will indicate if it's an, if it's an IRA or, or a SEP and whatnot. So we, so I could say, okay. Uh, if I have that, then we're going to say, let's say we had a hundred thousand from there and the taxable amount is a hundred thousand. And then we're going to have the withholdings from that possibly. So now if I go back on over, we can go then to the first page, we've got the 100,000 now, but it's coming from the pensions and annuities. All of it is taxable. We've got the 13,850 still for the standard deduction. I didn't change the age rate, so it could be different if they, if I changed their age rate to like retirement age, but I'm just going to keep it here. For example, 86,150 is the taxable income. And then page number two, we've got the 14,266 and I didn't enter anything for the withholdings. Now, when someone is in retirement, then it's usually a little bit more difficult on some people in retirement. If someone worked their entire year as a W-2 employee, they might have the type of pension plan where they're going to get paid out a set, a set amount each month, in which case the withholdings might be pretty much similar because they're going to have a standard amount of income coming from their retirement and you could set the withholdings from the 1099R and they're not going to change much. But sometimes you have a retirement type of account where you could decide how much you're going to take out of it. It's not going to be a fixed amount uh, each month. And in that case, you have to think about, well, how much, if I take that much money out, then how much am I going to have to pay for taxes? And that becomes more complex because it's not just a a calculation for a flat tax. You have to fit, you have to annualize how much you're going to take out for the entire year and then determine what the tax rate should be or how much withholdings you should have. So, uh, and that could be somewhat complex, especially for people that never had to do that during their working years because they've just been nudged. The government forced the employer to basically nudge them or do the work properly without really thinking about it. And then they put money into a 401k plan in order to get a tax benefit from it. That's just the thing to do. And now that they take the money out, they're going to be subject to taxes because that's how the 401k plans. It's just a deferral plan. And now you have kind of a more complex tax situation in retirement with calculating withholdings than they ever did when they were actually working. And so that could be somewhat of a shock to some people. So 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 they could then withhold on the 1099. So if we withhold on the 1099, then of course it would be shown here. Right now we'd have federal income tax withheld and you're going to say, okay, so now the withholdings would show up. If it was the 20,000 again, boom, we could see that on the 1099 and that would then pull over in a similar fashion as we saw with the W-2. There's the 14, there's the 20,000, there's the 5,734. Same kind of discussion happening then possibly saying, okay, is that a reasonable amount of uh, overpayment or should we, uh, should we try to reduce the amount of withholdings and so on and so forth for the next year? Now, if you're dealing with someone, like a lot of people have a whole bunch of money that are in different kinds of things because they didn't work at the same place their entire life, right? So they, so that's going to be more complex because now they might have a pension over here. They might have an IRA over there, a 401k, and they have all these different, uh, basically, retirement plans that are paying them and it becomes somewhat of a mess. So in that case, you might take the big one, the, the, the largest one, their main job, our 401k, 
and try to adjust the withholdings to deal with the fact that you've got all these other payments and take it out of that one place. That would be like the easiest automatic thing to do. But that might be complex given the fact that all these other withholdings are changing and whatnot. So you might then say, I'm going to do estimated tax payments or some combination of both of them. So if you have someone in, in retirement that has multiple, you might look at the prior year's income and say, okay, how much do you think you're going to be withholding uh, next year? How much do you think you're going to take out next year so that we can do estimated tax payments and then either adjust the withholdings possibly on your largest uh, distribution from the IRA or we say we keep that constant or remove that entirely and just do estimated tax payments. So we're going to say then you just make a payment to the government on a quarterly basis uh, and 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 do it that way, right? So that's going to be kind of the options you have for someone that's in uh, retirement. Oftentimes, again, their income is less stable sometimes because again, they have different retirement plans and possibly they're pulling money out for different needs that are that are coming up and it's it's not just like they're working steadily at the same job and getting paid the same amount uh, from year to year they might be going on vacation one year and then not doing just hanging out the next year or whatever who knows so Lynn, let's go back to let's go back and say well what if they're like a dub what if they're a schedule c income and then we're gonna say uh schedule c and this is going to be like miscellaneous business. We'll put our trustee 120,000 and then uh, the cost of goods sold. Let's put 20,000. Now, if they're getting their money from a Schedule C, we're going to go back on over. Obviously, the, the tax return is much more complicated because now we have the Schedule C. Uh, hold on. I didn't want to go in cost of goods sold. Let's do it down here so we can see it in advertising 20,000 that's what we've been doing before so now we've got the 120 in income the 20,000 expenses that gives us the 100,000 we know there's more complication to it because we also have to calculate the schedule se self-employment tax which is coming out to the 14 129 and half of that is deductible 7065 which rolls into the schedule one there's our 100,000 income from the schedule c page two there's our 75 that is the deductible part i'm going to get rid of the health insurance we're not dealing with that right now we could have that uh but no not this time let's get that out of there okay and then we're going to go to the form 1040 so now it's more complicated here because we've got the hundred thousand minus the seven thousand sixty five that's half of the self-employment tax that was deductible adjusted gross income 92,935. We got the standard deduction at the 13,850 still. And then we've got this qualified business income form 88,8995. Uh, Sorry for the dyslexic thing there. And that gives us the taxable income 63,268. And then on page two, we of course have the tax as well as the self employment tax. So that self employment tax is often something that new business people it's a shock because they're used to being w-2 employees over here where their federal income taxes is all they're really thinking about because that's what's linked to the 1040 and they're not really thinking about what the social security and medicare taxes are and how they relate if they were going to move from a w-2 job to self-employment and obviously that's a big chunk of money uh, in the calculation here. So in any case, we come up to the 23, uh, 357. So another common problem is someone moves from a W-2 employee situation where they've just been forced to pay their taxes because the government has made the employer into a tool, a tax collecting tool. Then uh, when they start to do their own business, they often get behind in the first year of taxes because they don't properly withhold. One, because they have no idea how much to withhold. Possibly they don't even know how to do bookkeeping really that well because that's not what their business is. So so, so now they end up at the end of the year uh, owing taxes in the prior year and they end up owing estimated taxes in the following year. So they become two years behind. So obviously from our standpoint, what we want to be able to tell the new business owners is, hey, you have to pay your taxes during the year 
uh, so that you don't get doubled up in the situation where you owe two years of taxes. You got to get in front of it. So that means they have to make estimated tax payments. And then, of course, the question is going to be, well, how in the world am I going to make estimated tax payments? Because I don't know how much I earned until I actually do my bookkeeping at the end of the year. Or possibly I know how much I earned in a month. Maybe I'm doing my bookkeeping as I go. I know how much I earned in a month. But I can't just pay taxes on the 5000 that I earned in the first month because then I would be at the lower tax brackets. You have to, of course, project annualize your earnings for the year so that you can get the proper amount of net income, which can then be used to pay the quarterly taxes on an annual basis because that's how the progressive tax system works. So again, you can use the tax software estimator tool on the IRS website to help with that. And that's just the way it is. So that's what we have to do. We have to figure out how, how can we annualize the tax payments so that you can make quarterly payments to properly make the payments uh, during the year. Now, if you have someone that's making payments for multiple years, again, we could have safe harbor rules, meaning we could say, hey, look, IRS, I made my estimated tax payments based on last year's income because that's the only thing I knew at the time. And hopefully that'll help us avoid penalties and interest uh, in the following year if I make my basic my payments based on the prior year. Okay, so so the estimated tax payments. So if I go to the estimated tax payments, we're going to say, duh, duh, duh. Uh, all right, so here's our estimated tax payments. So, so we could have had an overpayment from the prior year. Let's take a look at that uh, in a little bit here. Let's say that we had our estimated tax payments. Uh, now, the voucher amount represents what we would have had on the tax bill. Let's say it was like 5000 a quarter so then we're going to say the amount paid they paid five thousand now the first quarter ends uh it's it's going to be uh, the due date is 4 15 because the first quarter ends in the first three months january february march and then you have till the next month or 15 days to pay so i'm going to say this is going to be oh four one five two three and then the next uh voucher amount let's say was another five thousand we paid five thousand and then again, three months, January, February, March, April, May, June, and you have the 15 days, June 15th, to pay the second quarter after the quarter ended. So 06, 15, 2, 3, and then the third quarter, 5,000, and we'll say 5,000, and we're gonna say then again, the third quarter, you have until the 15th here to pay. So I'm gonna say 09, 15, 2, 3, and the fourth quarter, Fourth quarter, of course, ends at the end of the year, 5,000, 5,000. And we have until the next year to pay it. So 01, 15, 2, 4. That becomes important because when you get the bookkeeping from a client or something like that, or you look at your own bookkeeping, then you're going to be making these payments and then posting them somewhere. They're going to come out of your checking account, of course. But if you just look at the payments that were made for two or in 2023, then that might not that's not going to match up to the amount of payments were, that were assigned to tax year 2023 right so you have this cutoff or timing problem because you have to pay taxes for 2023 on a quarterly basis and for example the last quarter is going to be paid possibly or isn't due until 2024 so you got to make sure that you pick up the 2024 payment that you're applying to tax year uh, 2023. Also, you might have had a payment for 2000 and of course 2022 that was for the fourth quarter that wasn't paid until uh, 2023. So you're going to see that 2000 that payment that was applied to tax year 2022 coming out of the checking account in the bookkeeping in 2023. And you've got to make sure that you're applying the payment to the proper period. Also, you might have had an overpayment for tax year 2022. If you have an overpayment, you could take that overpayment, say, IRS, give me a refund. Or you could say, IRS, take that overpayment and apply it to the quarterly payments for 2023 right? We could say, just keep it, IRS, instead of you giving me the money and then I write you a check to 
for the first quarter payment, you just keep the overpayment. So let's imagine that was 2000. They just keep the overpayment from last year, they roll it over, and then we paid another 5000 per quarter. Now, one other thing to, to, to note here uh, is on uh, the state tax, you also have to, of course, break out the federal taxes, and you might, depending on the state that you're in, be owing state income taxes. For example, in California, you also have to deal with this kind of system with uh, the state income taxes and break those out. So you might uh, record those separately in your bookkeeping system or something like that. Also, remember that you have the tool of the IRS website. It's not always easy to log into the IRS website. They are certainly not up to date as far as their website orientation as businesses such as banking, where people are quite comfortable going on to the, their business banks online and logging in and the banks are up to date on that technology. A lot of people don't log into their IRS account and aren't comfortable doing that. And the login structure is not as easy uh, to deal with, but uh, it should get better and better. So more clients hopefully can log into their account and you can actually ask them, give me the information from your IRS account related to these estimated payments so that I can double check and make sure that I have these properly allocated according to what is on the IRS uh, side of things. And if there are any discrepancies, we can handle it beforehand rather than basically handling it after the IRS receives it. Also, this 2000 that was rolled over from the prior year, if you used the same software in the prior year as the current year, that will roll over automatically, which is great. But if there was a change to the taxes, for example, the IRS said, hey, your 2022 tax return had a problem in it. We fixed it on our end. They send you a letter saying, if you agree with it, just tell us you agree and we'll, we'll make the adjustment. If that happens, fine, that's great. But if the client doesn't give us that letter, then we're not going to know that the tax was changed last year. And we're going to have to put the change in here to make sure that we have the proper amount of the rollover from the prior year. Just a couple things uh, to keep in mind. So now if we go back on over, uh, we have our, our 2023 estimated tax payments. So now we have the tax at the 23, uh, 357, the 22,000, and then we have the amount that is owed. Note that the tax came out to be a higher tax here. Why? Because we had the self-employment tax. Now, remember, if they were a W-2 employee, they still would have paid the self-employment tax, Social Security and Medicare. They still have those taxes. We just didn't calculate them because they've already been handled by the government's tool, your employer, right? They, they forced your employer to deal with that. And that's why we, but now you're the tool, right? You're the tool that takes your own money for the government, right? And so we had to pay it on, that's why this 14,000 is here. So it's not, it's kind of hard to compare those two sometimes the W-2 working as a W-2 employee versus being a Schedule C uh, employee. So that's going to be our our calculation. Let's make it a little bit higher so that we can, let's say last year we had uh, 4,000 rollover. And so that's going to mean that we have an overpayment of 643. So obviously then next year we have to say, now you have to make your payments for the following for the following year. Notice if they didn't make this payment, what would happen? We're going to say, hey, you owe a ton of money right now. Not only that, but you have to make the first quarter estimated payments. It's already April, right? You're, you, you, you might be late. You know, you got to make your first quarter estimated payments for 2023. So, so, so we want to get ahead of the game. So if they're up to date, they've paid things off here, then we have to figure out what their estimated payments are going to be. Tax software can help us with that. So currently, this is what's being calculated for the estimated payments. You know, here's the uh, voucher number one, and then voucher number two, voucher number three, voucher number four. And then the question is, do we want to be making these estimated payments uh, electronically? Do we want to have them do the estimated payments? Sometimes you can use the tax software to help to populate the estimated payments if you want to put the banking information uh, into the software to kind of automate it. They can possibly log into their account on the IRS website and schedule the estimated payments, which is nice 
as long as you're sure that you're going to have money in the bank account to take out if you schedule the estimated payments. Uh, and they could, could, of course, use the voucher slips to do the old just send in a check type of thing. But the IRS more and more wants to get those electronic payments. So what we want to do is make sure that we have whatever system to make it as easy as possible to uh, make those estimated payments. Now, other thing to kind of note is that sometimes the state uh, taxes are going to be deductible on uh, the Schedule A for estimated payments here. And that's going to be influenced by that timing difference as well, because these taxes that are paid, if you pay state income taxes, so if we go back to my estimated tax payment, we pay state income taxes, it's usually on a cash-based system. So this last payment that we made right here in 2024, although it's applied to tax year 2023 for federal income tax calculation purposes, might not be included the state tax that we paid on that D might not be, it'll be included on the state tax for the calculation of the taxes we paid applied to 2023, but might not be deductible on the Schedule A because we didn't pay it until 2024. So again, that cutoff stuff can get a little bit messy and you want, if you have tax software, the tax software can help you to properly allocate and then you can kind of double check and deconstruct hey, are these payments going to the right place? Why does it make sense? Uh, and, and then double check that to what the IRS says by logging into the IRS account and checking those numbers. Okay, let's go to the form 1040 page number two. So, so we have our payments here. And then of course, again, we can use these numbers to estimate the tax payments for the following year. If they're gonna have a substantial change in their income, then we can run further projections uh, and try to make adjustments to think about what their quarterly taxes would be owed. We might also, again, try to use safe harbor rules and say, hey, look, IRS, I made my estimated tax payments based on the prior year's uh, tax information. Okay, beyond that, uh, just note that you could have uh, withholdings on like a W2G, I believe is a gambling winnings. So if they won money in Vegas or whatever, they might be given a W2G, which we would have to input. And possibly uh, if there were substantial winnings, they might've been forced to have withholdings on uh, the winnings or something like that. In which case, similar kind of situation when you do the data input with a W2, you got the withholdings here. Also, if they're a sole proprietor business, they might get 1099, uh, form 1099 non-employee compensation. So when we're creating our Schedule C, we might have information that is 1099 supporting or backing up this number on the income. We might not because we might be like a hairstylist or something, in which case we do work for an end customer instead of for a business. And the IRS doesn't have the leverage to force people getting their hair cut to give the IRS a 1099 to rat out the person who cut their hair, right? They don't have that leverage. They do have the leverage, however, if you work for another business. Let's say you have a small business and your clients are car manufacturers or something like that. Well, the, the government does have leverage over the car manufacturers to say, if you paid the sole proprietor contractor, we want to we want you to rat them out, giving us a 1099 so we can go after them on the income side on their side, right? So 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 you might get 1099s. Most of the time, when you get a 1099, it's not and whether you get a 1099, you should be reporting the income either way. That's the general idea. But most of the time, when you get this 1099. It's just going to show you the compensation. There's not going to be federal income tax withheld, but there could be, right? There possibly could be. Now, when, 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 would it, when would it happen? Usually when, the, like if the person giving you the 1099 didn't have your information and therefore were required to do withholdings because, because they're not required to do withholdings unless they don't have some information or in some weird situation where you asked them to do withholdings, which is kind of unusual. But just note with a 1099 NEC or miscellaneous, it's possible that this box is filled out with the withholdings, in which case you would want to put that into the, the withholding section for 
the 1099s uh, somewhere in here for the form for the forms 1099. Okay.